mixing music. My friends on social media, the YouTube community in particular, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you are, I bring you mixing the musical idiom. This is a new vlog and a new series which is going to have some continuity and in every episode I'm going to explore some crazy things like how you can take a folk song and put a dubstep soundscape on it and so on and so forth. We are going to be talking to some amazing musicians and going through the whole music making process and how to sort of make musical cocktails, you know, good tasty cocktails. And the name of the series or the working title of the series is Mixing the Musical Idiom. Idiom spelled I-D-I-O-M, not E-D-M. But we shall be talking about dance music also. Um, so this, the first episode, is more from the perspective of a classical sitar player, which is what I am. And I grew up spending most of my uh, teenage years, you know, being told and, and learning that um, oh, you know, stay away from other kinds of music. Learn the raga, learn the tala, and, you know, and try to stay within the raga. And that's how it should be. And, and as a classical musician, that's what I do, even to this day. But gradually, as you begin to develop wings, and you, or rather your ears begin to develop wings, you fly out into other genres, and you... You listen to a bit of this and a bit of that and you begin thinking that, you know, you begin thinking, is this the only musical idiom that exists? Are there other emotions that I want to express? And, and I think that is what drove me to kind of um, you know, try to meld with other musical genres, with other soundscapes and figure out what I could do with my instrument, which is the sitar, uh, in order to achieve uh, a good synthesis. Uh, justifiable synthesis of different musical styles. So first of all, there's the question of harmony. What we play uh, on Indian instrument is more modal. It is based on a scale, which we call the raga. And then we have our Sarigama Padanisa, which is literally... And in this instrument, for instance, we have the sympathetic strings. The frets can be moved up and down. As you saw, I just moved the Komaldha down to make it a Shuddha and now I'm going to tune the sympathetics. So the Komaldha is going to become the Shuddha and I'm going to do it real quick and give you time to hit the like or subscribe button on my page on my YouTube channel so that you can be notified of all upcoming videos in this series and other videos as well there you go interesting thing is if you hear this drum you're already hearing a major scale you're actually you're even hearing a two note chord like you're actually hearing all of this However, the approach towards the music is much more modal. It is based on the concept of a melody. Now, there is an underlying sense of harmony, which I shall be talking about in some other episode. Uh, so first thing that we need to figure out is we talk Sare Gama Pada Nisa, which is Do Re Mi Fa Sol La Si Do. Now, if I was, I was going to play with a jazz musician or, uh, you know, uh, an R&B musician or whatever, I would not be able to tell them that my sa is D and that's it and I'm not able to hit other notes and even in an instrument like the sitar where you can move the frets around you cannot hit the entire chromatic range of notes so I would be able to get or, or but I wouldn't be able to get this note which is the E flat note or the D sharp note so if I want to play with more harmonic forms of music. This is the first step for you sitar players out there, is try to figure out how to pull the string and get the entire chromatic range of notes. Here you go. So the komal ray has to be pulled. 
Now, say I was soloing on a bunch of chords, okay? I've been given a harmonic progression because that is how it works in, in jazz or that is how it works in any Western form of music. And you got a solo on the form and you're gonna be given a harmonic progression and you've got a solo on it. So say D, okay, D major. Now, within a D major kind of structure, I have freedom. I have the mode, yes, I do have the mode. And uh, say I were given a Lydian mode, which is. But I could easily do this. So I could actually play Bhopali phrase in the middle of a. Yaman phrase that's okay now if I had a key change for instance I'm doing a solo C major through the progressions this is something that uh, me personally I'm trying to achieve this better every day so that I can really go through the form of a song and uh, and do it seamlessly it's very difficult on an instrument like the sitar because you only have so many notes plus the other thing that you have to if you, you may have noticed this already is when I'm playing uh, an Indian melody I'm actually hitting the chikari strings much more because it's on D and that's my tonic and and I can do that you know but if I were playing the same melody on uh, C C major I'd not be able to hit the chikari and the and the jor string and the other strings because you know that they're tuned uh, to a different uh, so essentially they're hitting a different chord or a different harmony uh, for that matter so this is the first thing now to get into the the subject of phrasing so uh, there are two aspects to this you've got to phrase according to the genre of the song when you get into a specific genre or a specific kind of sound you got to phrase according to that so when I'm playing a very folksy kind of Indian uh, tune Let's say um, a Bhatiani kind of a, a tune. The phrasing is replete with Indian kind of ornamentation and, and that's because that's what prompts uh, you know uh, that kind of mood it takes you to that kind of space but if I were to play uh, the same thing for a uh, for a Western kind of a melody or a Western kind of a song for instance there's a song that I composed called breakfast in paradise <laughs> see that's Indian that's a Western phrase it's a guitar phrase. Indian. 
गिटार इंडियन गिटार गिटार वेस्टर्न सो द होल आइडिया इज टू ब्रिंग दैट ऑल्सो टू द टेबल बिकॉज यू नो अदरवाइज इट्स गोन बी लाइक वॉटर एंड ऑयल सो यू गॉट आई मीन अ बिग इश्यू आई थिंक विद अ लॉर्ड ऑफ कोलेबरेटर्स इज दैट दे ब्रिंग द रागा ताला हायर आर की एंड एंड यू आई हैव हर्ड मेनी वेस्टर्न म्यूजिशियन टॉक अबाउट दिस इज दैट यू नो यू गाइज कम टू अस एंड यू से learn this phrase in this raga and this is you know can you can you do this uh, you know note this is bhairo don't play any note outside this raga and that's really speaking a little unfair on them cuz you are imposing your hierarchy on them without learning enough of their structures their forms of course in all fairness the modern generation of musicians has very ably learned the western form and uh, and they are able to very seamlessly go from one to the other so coming back to the subject of phrasing while you are doing that and while it's important to imitate uh, i mean a lot of guitar players imitate saxophone phrasing and i think a lot of contemporary sitar players will end up imitating guitar phrasing and you know then you have guitar players who are trying to cross over who imitate sitar phrasing for instance so all that's going to happen but you got to bring the original flavor of your instrument you know and that's very important and i'm going to demonstrate this you know, uh, you know with a couple of examples uh, because you know that's why they're calling you is because you're bringing your essence to the table and as much as it's okay to you know do this but they are calling you for this that's why they want you otherwise they would have called you called a guitar player right so try never to lose your essence and try to bring that to the table try to correlate some of the uh information that you're gathering or extrapolate rather some of the information that you're gathering from these other instruments regarding phrasing and try to put that information into your playing uh and yet retain the essence of what your instrument is about so to give you a a little example of of how this is done um say the raga hamsadhvani which is a very interesting example because it's it's the major 7th chord if you add a ninth that's the raga so you know so i have a a loop here which has been created which is just a very open chords kind of a loop so it will fit into pretty much any major scale it could fit into hamsadhvani or it could fit into yaman which is the lydian lydian mode uh, but the interesting thing about yaman is just as you have this you know a, a d major then so you also have a e major harmony going there and and there are changes happening there and you can even go if you settle down on the dha which is um, so you know this is the b note so you know you have all these harmonies going you have all these different harmonies going and if you would arpeggiate it you would see that 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 would create a very different flavor so when you are phrasing right and this is very important as an indian musician when you when you're phrasing uh you have to take those harmonic departures now if i would have programmed some harmonies into this and uh, then you would hear the the you know the harmonic differences but i never uh, nevertheless i will do those harmonic departures i'll go through some of those changes and and demonstrate to you so here's a how i play hamsadhvani as an indian musician okay lagi lagan vata pi ganapati
Hamsat Adha and Hamsat Dhaniya would be hung by the Indian classical festivals and rightly so because I'm there to play the raga but if I were to do this in a new age crossover people like to call it fusion because it's essentially mixing different things then I could do it so gare gare right gare da the harmony changes gare da gare da da ga different harmony right da sa ga that's the harmony That's why they're calling you, man, for the Indian phrasing. Gani, so this is what is the bida rang. for us it's all the same at the end of end of the day the grace notes and grace notes in western music also change harmony change of harmony something to the table which shows that you are ready to take a step or two forward in the direction of the music that you're hearing you're responding in the moment to what's going on gabani this is a little bit western a little indian gabani episode i really just wanted to talk about uh, how you approach this as an indian melody player more specifically as an instrument player and that too as a sitar player because that's what i am uh, in subsequent episodes uh, we are going to be talking about how this happens with lyrical content how i would take a thumri and put it in a soul kind of a soundscape or how i would take a folk song 
and put it into a dubstep kind of a soundscape or a hip hop kind of soundscape. How I would take up uh, like, uh, for instance, um, uh, a tarana and put it in a in a drum and bass kind of soundscape. We've already done that with uh, a song called Antar, which you have liked so much um, and, uh, you know, have listened to it. We have taken, a, a, you know, a very traditional composition, which is called uh, uh, Shiva Shankara. And we have put that in a kind of a trancey kind of a, a soundscape with the tuk 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 going, and of course none other than the legendary Ustad Zakir Hussein Sai playing on top of that. Uh, you know, doesn't get better than that, right? And and the great Shankar Mahadevan navigating. In fact, that's that's a lesson in itself. Shankarji navigating through the harmonies and keeping the raga, and yet you know when he's doing his sargams and all, and and Zakir Bhai when he's going through. Uh, you know, he's playing his, his kaidas or his, his relas or his patterns and yet how he's playing the groove and not the theka. He's not playing a rupaktal theka, he's playing the groove. Um, so these are things which we learn from the great masters about because they have they've been doing this forever and, and, uh, and they have built the bridge, so to speak, in which we are, we are trying to kind of uh, cross it a little bit. And, uh, and in Antar, we've taken, uh, of course, it f features the brilliant Kaushiki Chakravarti ji. Uh, and, and we've taken a Tarana, which, uh, you know, I had composed and she's written words on it. And then, but we put it into a drum and bass kind of uh, soundscape with a brilliant Shikhar Nag on, on, the, on the drums. And, and we are going to uh, talk about these uh, different perspectives, you know, from the perspective of somebody who is singing lyrical content from the perspective of the spoken word, a rapper, for instance. We're going to be doing um, rhythms. We're going to be seeing how rhythms go from one zone into the other um, and a lot more. And, and uh, let me tell you this. I don't want to spoil the surprise for you. But at the end of this entire series, there's going to come a very special song, which will get produced as we go along. You're going to see the production happen in this entire series. And it's a brilliant song. I won't reveal it just yet. You're going to soon hear the song in its organic form. And it's beautiful in its organic form and it's composed by a very great musician, not my composition. And then we are going to put it into this very different soundscape and you're going to hear the end result. And we will also break down and unlock a few other compositions and, and give you the whole creative process. So stay tuned to the mixing of the musical idiom. See you guys. <laughs> 